Okay, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining the Build Direct Investor Webinar. For first time viewers, Build Direct is a leading omni channel building material retailer that delivers quality building materials and services to the North American homeowner and home improvement professionals. Build Direct is listed on the TSX V under the ticker symbol BUILD, that's B I L D. My name is Prit Singh, your host for today, and our main presenters today will be the CEO of Build Direct, Sean Wilson, and CFO of Build Direct, Matthew Alexander. Before we begin, just some housekeeping rules. Please remain muted throughout the presentation. The investor presentation will take approximately 20 minutes, and we will jump into the Q&A session right after the webinar. If you have any questions during the webinar, feel free to send them in using the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Alternatively, if you are calling in to listen to the webinar today, please email your questions directly to ir at builddirect.com. Again, that's ir at builddirect.com. With that out of the way, I will turn the call over to Sean Wilson, CEO of Build Direct. I appreciate that. Looking forward to uh, getting started here. Thank you to everyone for joining and looking forward to uh, going through our company and our update. Uh, we look at Build Direct. We um, have had a pretty uh, pretty good run uh, this year. We, you know, first off, all numbers here are in USD, uh, the nine-month results. And we're expecting gross margins to be about the same, top line around 90 million and a pretty big EBITDA swing. Uh, our business is um, a uh, omni-channel retailer, as uh, as was mentioned, and for the most part, we're focused on the flooring, the flooring segment. The flooring industry in the U.S. is around $71 billion, is significant, and is comprised mostly of independent retailers, uh, some big box, and also um, a relatively small portion online. And with that, it's relatively, uh, relatively fragmented market, and we play both in the uh, brick and mortar and also e-commerce side and are pursuing an omni-channel connected uh, strategy. From a, a macro perspective, the uh, flooring industry looks to be relatively resilient. We have a uh, pretty good um, uh, you know, glut of old homes may need to be re renovated, a lot of remodeling work, and also uh, you know, really a shortage in, in housing based on population growth. And so you know, with that, we see a lot of strength still in the flooring market. And for the most part, we are segment agnostic, not necessarily uh, indexed in one segment over the other, for example, new construction or commercial, but rather serve the broad market. Um, really focus on the pro customer, but not tied to any specific segment. So overall, uh, a good uh, outlook for, for the flooring industry. Myself, I spent the last 20 years in the flooring industry, working at companies such as Mohawk Industries, the world's largest flooring manufacturer, Home Depot, uh, Plum, and also Romanoff. That's a uh, service provider for uh, big box retail, providing fulfillment services, uh, installation services, things like that. And for me, this industry has been quite interesting, fascinating, kind of learning it from the inside out from every different uh, you know, uh, angle side and you know, throughout the, the experience, really identifying uh, opportunities that can be exploited and really used to build out a, a healthy, strong, uh, strong business. The, the main thing is identified throughout my career. There's a lot of unnecessary complexity that resides in the flooring industry. You know, things like um, conflicting brand stories, you know, multiple uh, you know, manufacturers that service you know, very similar products. It's also very difficult to scale with a full service model where you're trying to control everything from, you know, uh, point to point, uh, sourcing all the way through installation. And for the most part, competitors, companies kind of grow up and, uh, and grow through specific segments, for example, like new construction or uh, A&D or commercial um, government work, things like that. And so you have a lot of risk a lot of times that enters into their models where they're over indexed potentially in one specific um, you know, sub segment. Now, our strategy is very straightforward. So we are reducing complexity kind of throughout the value chain, starting off with sourcing all the way through fulfillment. And we're focused on serving the pro customer, um, you know, regardless of what sub subsegment, new construction, renovation, restoration, things like that, that they might be, might be serving. And with that, uh, have a greater uh, resiliency. What's interesting about the flooring industry is although there are all these different customer segments and user segments, the products that serve those segments are, are very similar and relatively portable from one to the other. So our strategy of focusing on the pro versus uh, focusing on a certain customer segment will be a lot um, uh, more, more durable and also provide a lot of growth, growth opportunities. 
Coming into Build Direct, I joined back in September of, uh, of last year, um, just kind of starting off here. This is a great company, great thesis, uh, and also a really good um, you know, kind of initial starting point. But really kind of coming in, I focused the operations on the core business model and really focused the team, um, uh, kind of cut back on uh, any kind of uh, outside projects, unnecessary processes, and kind of excess throughout the, throughout the model to really hone in on what the, the core business it really was all about. And with that established a very clear path for profitability for the commerce division, which historically was, you know, a higher growth, but um, even a losing division, whereas the brick and mortar were, uh, you know, uh, relatively stable growth and, and uh, you know, positive. But, uh, you know, from there, we started driving some immediate synergies, you know, things like freight cost, uh, sourcing opportunities, so on and so forth to, um, you know, pick up a lot of low hanging fruit on uh, cost reductions and also leverage synergies for growth opportunities also, which have shown up in our announcements more recently with large contracts that we've uh, we've uh, we've picked up. And with that, we have a very clear model for both organic and also um, acquiring uh, uh, additional companies you know, from a growth perspective. So we have uh, a two uh, two prong approach uh, approach there. It's a great company that you know with these uh, these items have had. A uh, pretty big impact, and also you're really leading a turnaround effort here to focus operations, and with that, uh, have a, a keen eye on profitability and growing through, uh, going going through cash flows, which is a pretty you know good time to enter into the company. Now, I want to step back and talk about what a pro customer uh, is. Um, there's a lot of different definitions out there that get used, but for us, a pro customer falls into these categories: you know, builders, GCs. Uh, property investors, and then also we have uh, development companies that come in and either are renovating apartments and turning into condos or developing apartments from the from the ground up, but also flooring contractors. We have a significant base of customers who are subcontractors in the respective area that uh, use our products and services to effectively build their business on top of, which provides a tremendous opportunity for us to grow through their efforts uh, collectively without having a significant marketing uh, and growth costs on that side. For us, focusing on the pro and making sure we provide products and services to help them build their business is really what Build Direct is uh, is all about. When you think about what we provide. Uh, it's not just uh, hard surface and carpet materials and supplies, but we also provide um, other services, things like you know, white label e-commerce services, uh, warranty programs, also things like payment services. We think about what a pro actually needs to operate their business. So often it extends beyond just product, product, product. Also, um, you know, are things to help them actually build out and service their customers. And so from my background and also our team's capability you know, perspective, we have a very unique uh, position to be able to provide pros all that they, they need to build out their uh, their own respective businesses, and you know, therefore creating sticky relationships with those with those customers. We have a, a pretty good list of services that are also being just stemmed from our uh, constant pro interaction and feedback. We have uh, thousands of them that buy from us, um, you know, very uh, very regularly. And so, with that, we plan on focusing on their needs and adding products and services that you know really uh, address those those specific needs. So, for us, we have a clear roadmap, and we don't have to really guess what. What the pro customer wants because they're in our network today and we have a very uh, active um, relationship with uh, with them. We think about the MA pipeline for us, the flooring industry, as I mentioned before, is about $71 billion at retail, highly fragmented, around 10,000 or so independent retailers. And with that, um, a lot of retailers, as I mentioned, that are focused on different, different segments. When you kind of zoom out and look at the uh, potential pipeline for MA, there's a considerable amount of retail targets uh, in the U.S. and also in Canada, but we're looking more more specifically for pro-focused uh, retailers that can be added into our network with our store warehouse and online omni-channel uh, kind of format. And so, when you think about M and A, that's what we're looking for, and that's what we've identified. We have quite a few targets that uh, fit in very well, and also we've demonstrated the an ability to acquire at uh, the right price and also integrate the companies into our into our network successfully, which is uh, definitely a, um, a prerequisite for companies looking to do uh, M&A in a industry such as flooring that 
you know, tends to have a, a very fragmented, very fragmented, uh, uh, and mostly entrepreneurial uh, you know, company base. So for us, we have a pretty good pipeline, great targets, and we'll be very opportunistic in how we kind of think through growing our business, both organically and also through uh, through M and A. When you put the story together and you kind of look at how we we fit in, how we serve the pro market compared to uh, potential competitors, you know, we we definitely are in a spot where we have a strong e-commerce operation. We have um, uh, our initial footprint for brick and mortar. And when you think through how we're adding locations, both organically and also through M&A, we're going to be in a unique position to provide uh, a pro customer products and services, regardless of geography, in a way that's very cost effective and very much centered on the pro. Although competitors, um, like for example, Home Depot and Florida Core, you know, talk about uh, pros as being a meaningful customer, which they, you know, of course are. We're looking at it more from the perspective of how can we build a business all around the pro customer, um, you know, versus having pro customers buy from a more consumer driven shopping experience. And so for us, we have, uh, although we do have some homeowners that uh, through our website, for example, can, can buy, everything is really built around that pro customer um, who eventually then services their own customers who tend to be homeowners. Uh, and or other B2B uh, customers. So uh, so with that, um, Matt, do you want to take over uh, talking through our performance? Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Sean. Uh, so these are Q3 results, uh, and I think our financial performance is showing how we're executing on our results and or executing on our strategy. So on the revenue side, we're maintaining our revenues year over year uh, on an annualized basis. We're expecting 90 million plus uh, in terms of revenue. Within those revenue numbers, the co composition is, is changing. So we're moving away from the B2C or homeowner customer uh, to B2B, which is our pro customer. So the pro customer provides us repeat business and creates better unit, unit economics and better profitability for the business. So you can see that when you shift over to the EBITDA and the adjusted EBITDA side. So we have a significant improvement year over year, about a million dollars in terms of a change. Uh, and really breaking that down, there's there's three main factors uh, in, in terms of that change. Firstly, uh, in Q3 of 2022, we made significant adjustments on our fixed costs. So on the e-commerce side, we reduced our headcount by close to 50%, uh, which we're now seeing some savings on that fixed cost side. The second component that is helping drive some of this profitability is the reduction in marketing spend. So as we shift our focus to the B2B customer, our need for marketing spend uh, drops. So we've been able to shift that marketing spend down and still maintain our, our revenue levels. Um, and then lastly, I think one of the big pieces is, is having Sean on board. So as Sean mentioned earlier, he's um, been able to look at the e-commerce segment develop pricing strategies to ensure uh, we, we're getting the best um, uh, price from the from our products and uh, make sure that the, the cost structure is best in class. So I think his focus uh, on the e-commerce side has been a, a huge improvement in terms of profitability for that business. Uh, and then on the brick and mortar side of the business, uh, Sean's extensive flooring background has been really helpful driving the synergies that we see within the business. So uh, as an example, uh, reviewed products, uh, tried to identify the most cost-effective products across the business, and he's been able to drive those synergies throughout the business. Uh, at this point, we, the year-end results are expected to be out in early April, and we're expected to see a similar story with our year-end results uh, as it's shown here. So we can move on to the next slide here. So in terms of 2023, uh, our focus is similar to how we ended 2022. We're continuing to focus on streamlining the operations of our existing business to improve uh, profitability and our margins. And then we'll continue to look for other uh, creative acquisitions of independent retailers throughout North America. So moving forward. So in terms of the key investment highlights, again, similar to what we've uh, seen in the past, I think there's a huge market in flooring. This is an area that uh, there's 71 billion uh, in terms of an addressable market in the US. So we feel like there's that opportunity is there for us. Um, in terms of, the, we've also improved the overall uh, financial outlook. So we've done the heavy lifting to, to change the profitability of the business. 
uh, and we feel like we're that we've put ourselves in a good good position for 2023 to have strong a strong financial outlook. Uh, and number three, that there's an active M&A program and a pipeline for us to to execute against. So these can provide a creative growth for us, uh, where we can improve uh, margins within these uh, these acquisitions, uh, and these are cash flow generative uh, acquisitions that will help improve the business moving forward. And lastly, world class management team and board uh, that can actually execute on this strategy. So moving forward. Quickly looking at the capital structure, I think a couple points on this slide. Uh, this is based on February 24th. Um, at this point, the implied enterprise value, we have it calculated at 15.3 million US or 20 million uh, Canadian. Given our revenue numbers of over 90 million and our significantly improved EBITDA forecast, we feel like there's opportunity and this doesn't reflect um, uh, the, the company's true value. Uh, the other component here is the inside ownership. So at this point, 65% of our shares are owned by three uh, insiders, Pelicanus, BD Capital, and Lyric Growth. These three insiders are actively involved um, in, in ensuring the success of the business, and they've provided some debt and equity financing through 2022 to reinforce that commitment. So it's great having those partners, those institutional investors on board to ensure the su success uh, of Build Direct. Uh, so we can move forward and I'll pass it back over to Sean here. Yeah, from a, a management perspective, we're building out a team that both has extensive uh, industry experience in building materials, but also along with that um, cross-functional across e-commerce as well as uh, brick and mortar. So there'll be uh, you know, more kind of coming, kind of coming there. When you think about um, you know, really the company, the thesis, great, you know, really great, um, you know, initial mission, thesis, uh, execution, you know, kind of building out systems, process, so on and so forth. Now, now from here, taking it to the next step, you know, really backfilling those needs in and making sure we have a very balanced, uh, balanced team. On the uh, the board side, we have a great, uh, great set of board members that have extensive experience in the M and A. Um, uh, marketing side and also capital markets and you know with that i uh, feel like we have great oversight uh, great partnerships and uh, from there can you really build out the next big phase of this company which is effectively um you know focusing on profitability growing through going through cash flows and really sticking with the um the thesis of building building a uh, an amazing retail experience for the pro customer and with that our unique position in a very large market being that we are starting off with a, a business close to 100 million um, that's omnichannel base, and we've uh, you know really uh, shored up when it comes to um, you know margins as well as as well as EBITDA here uh, moving forward. All right, so with that, um, Prit, we'll move on to questions. Thank you, Sean and Matt. Um, as discussed earlier uh, on the call, uh, we'll move into the Q and A session uh, of the presentation now. Should you have any questions, you can submit them to the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, right where it says Q&A. Uh, alternatively, if you're calling in today, you can email us directly at ir at builddirect.com. Again, that's ir at builddirect.com. Uh, first question. So just backing up, um, can you give uh, our, us and the listeners a breakdown of how much revenue is generated from Build Direct's e-commerce platform versus the brick and mortar locations? Yeah, I can jump in on that one. Um, so roughly the breakdown is one third e-commerce and two third uh, brick and mortar. So that translates to 30 million uh, from the e-commerce side and, uh, and 60 million coming from the brick and mortar. Perfect. And then Sean, if you could just maybe expand a little bit on Build Direct's competitive advantages compared to your competitors. I know you touched on it a little bit. Yeah, so you know, think about our e-commerce and brick and mortar. Uh, you know, the the model we're moving towards pretty fast is effectively having store slash warehouses where we have um, our e-commerce business being fulfilled, but being fulfilled with the same you know direct import you know for manufacturing SKUs that are also sold locally to uh, you know to the trade and different different other outlets uh, within the local markets, and so that that first and foremost is a, a very big portion of it because when you think about 
the pro customer, they're not looking typically for, you know, 100 or 200 square feet of a specific product, but um, our average order value is pretty, is pretty large. Um, and so with that, having the inventory available, not just for pickup, but also for delivery, delivery is one of the biggest concerns that on time delivery, um, one of the biggest concerns that pros always have. And so that really uniquely positions us to, to serve that, that market. There's a lot of great retailers out there who have products available for homeowners to pick up today. We can get into, you know, one, two, 3,000 square foot projects, these big pro projects that we really specialize in. Uh, having the ability of having that sent to a job site on time and great integrity um, very consistently is a huge competitive advantage that really requires an omni-channel kind of approach that service from a store warehouse type of format. Okay, great. Uh, and just expanding on that a little bit, are there any pro customers that were not covered during your presentation, which you believe would be a good fit for Build Direct's target market? Yeah. So when you when you think about how we service, um, we service you know different uh, pro customers. We have different penetrations across our different our different businesses. So for example, our brick and mortar tends to have more direct to the trade uh, customers, uh, subcontractors who are. Uh, completing their own projects kind of home by home, which is a mostly referral driven, driven business. You know, that one's a really interesting one. There are, um, I mean, different estimates out there, but uh, if there are 10,000 foreign retailers out there, it's probably close to about uh, 500,000 just foreign subcontractors. And thinking through how you can actually service that segment from an e-commerce perspective is quite interesting and something that we've been you're really playing around with trying to figure out what they actually need to facilitate their business in a way that's a lot less um, clunky today. So I'd probably say that's one of the biggest categories that we're really interested in is, is how can we better enable subcontractors, the, the folks actually doing the work who have their own projects, who move job to job, uh, mm -hmm. you know, how do you provide them a platform from an e-commerce perspective to be more successful, uh, which is a a massive opportunity and I think uh, something that the foreign industry has um, has yet to unlock. And that flows really well into the next question here. Um, how do you plan on monetizing those aforementioned services uh, provided to the pro customer? You touched on e-commerce, obviously. Yeah. yeah, so it'll definitely be um, uh, more of a SaaS model. When you think about uh, you know those types of services, they're kind of the bedrock for what the what that customer can really build off of. So we've done some initial pilots, to try to understand value uh, creation on what we can provide. And it's it's quite fascinating. I mean, so, you know, for example, you can sign up for a basic website as a entrepreneur, uh, let's say you use Wix or something and it's either free or next to free. Um, but that's, that's extremely low value compared to what you actually need uh, when it comes to a site that it provides also touch points for your customer uh, who knows, maybe even products and samples uh, for your customer, things like that. So our intent is to provide those kind of services you know, definitely with, uh, with revenue attached, but to ensure that the value so far exceeds the, the price that uh, you create a lot of, a lot of stickiness. Uh, even basic things like being able to take credit card payments um, you know, for, their, for their ultimate end customer is a challenge for pros. And I think um, you know, the flooring industry has a lot, of, um, a lot of opportunity kind of locked up um, you know, with it even um, growing itself, when you think about how many people, you know, initially start the journey to buy flooring, and it's a seventy billion dollar TAM, great, but just based on how many people are coming into it, probably should be closer to to hundred, uh, hundred billion. And so, with that, with that stated, really understanding that this is a home service industry, it's driven mostly by by pros. And the easier you can make that experience for pros and less funky, the better off, um, the faster you can grow. Okay, great. Uh, next question. Um, explain how you use your fulfillment centers and third-party fulfillment centers with your e-commerce business. Yeah, so so today our third-party fulfillment centers just service uh, the the products for our online business. Um, however, we're rapidly moving towards a model where uh, we have uh, kind of like consistent inventory um, where we can leverage that across the across the businesses, Build Direct has built a very lean and very effective import um, uh, and distribution business, uh, initially for its e-commerce business. But as we go into brick and mortar, 
we can provide a tremendous uh, cost savings to those those companies. When you think about third party logistics um, and you have you know uh, a warehouse directing space in, for example, in a city, I'm much more interested in taking that out of third party logistics, putting into more of a store warehouse kind of format, and then also servicing a local community to drive organic growth, greater inventory turns, kind of things like that. So in our past, in our past, uh, um, you know, webinars and, and a lot of our materials, we're we're talking about how we're moving towards more of a store warehouse kind of format that can service on online, and then also service a local community um, by having that really uniform. A product offering and uh, coordinated marketing strategies. Okay, great. Uh, do you know uh, offhand what the returning customer rate is both online and in store? Yeah, Matt, do you want to handle that one? Yeah, so the recurring, the in store recurring uh, revenue rate is upwards of 90%. So a lot of the customers, um, are coming back every year and it's a very steady <laughs> customer base online it's about 70 percent uh, on the pro customers in terms of the repeat rate uh, so yeah again once once we get them in the door and can service them with the products uh, we're, we're seeing good um, uh, um, retention rates for those pro customers yeah on the homeowner side we even see roughly uh, you know it's low at double digits but a return rate as well but it makes sense when you think about an individual uh customer you know they're uh, typically just adding on a room or second room or third room uh the next year or year after okay great uh so just shifting focus to you know, the m a program you touched on uh, can you tell us more about how build direct's previous acquisitions have contributed to the growth of build direct yeah, I'll provide a couple of uh, uh, strategic points, Matt. I'll turn over to you on on the financial you know part of that. So I'd say kind of first and foremost, um, those acquisitions were very strategic in nature, very much uh, pro focused, and then with that, a lot of shared learnings on uh, you know really what can you bring up on the e-commerce side and what can you what can you bring down um, as well. And so just kind of coming in and seeing the the synergies that are real tangible things you could you could put in place you know kind of like tomorrow uh was definitely very you know very insightful also bringing in additional expertise into the industry we're a big believer in buying healthy great companies and management teams that can uh, really add value uh, to the the collective whole organization we definitely have seen that as well um in the last part i mentioned whenever you're pulling together different companies and learn learned this uh uh, sometimes the easy way, sometimes the, the hard way in the, in the past, um, you know, really growing up at Mohawk Industries and, you know, sitting there firsthand watching the companies, uh, the company buy great, healthy companies and pull them into the fold. But also with that, um, making sure you have, you know, um, independent enough workflows, great teams that can drive your local business. And with that, provide feedback and insights into the, the larger whole. So that collaboration part has been great. Uh, financially, it's been pretty great as well. Uh, Matt, do you want to grab that yeah, one? Yeah, I can, I can jump in. So I think uh, one of the acquisitions, uh, so both of the acquisitions have grown in terms of revenue year over year, which has been, been great to see. Uh, one of them up to 23% year over year revenue growth and uh, has improved their EBITDA by about three million or two and a half million since we, we had, since the acquisition date. So uh, a lot of success um, in both revenue and profitability from the businesses. Um, so yeah, I think in the two cases that we have so far, we have some, some strong indications of improved revenue from the synergies that we're putting in place and, and, and profitability. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question, uh, which U S states does build direct plan to expand its physical footprint? Yeah, so um, when it comes to, so I, I'll, I'll answer that two ways. When it comes to the uh, the e-commerce business, you know, for, for the for the most part, we're going to stay focused on um, on the northeast, south, uh, southeast, midwest, and uh, the the southwest. And so that that's our current you know our current plan with uh, potentially putting in a facility up uh, up in the the pack north, but that's not a, a you know, current priority. We actually operate a business um, location as well in in Western Canada, which we'll continue to kind of build out. 
when it comes to the to the M and A side, so um, we're, we're being very cautious there on making sure we drive that decision more from the company fit, and um, you know less from trying to find a specific location in a specific you know state, and then kind of being forced through options. Candidly, I think that's where uh, some companies kind of go wrong uh, when they're looking at M and A targets. They um, they don't have a path to you know provide fulfillment potentially organically, which we do. And so for us, um, you know, ideally, uh, you know, we'll uh, continue building out in the Midwest and South and Northeast, but it doesn't stop us uh, from uh, really picking up deals where where they make uh, where they make sense, where it's more about the company and less about the um, the specific geographical area. Okay, great. Uh, let's shift focus here. Next question around profitability. Um, you've obviously highlighted that that's a near-term um, catalyst and near-term um, goal. Uh, can you expand a little bit on the strategy and how you plan on reaching profitability? Sure. So when, when you kind of zoom out and look at the yeah at profitability for the company, uh, it's definitely a tale of kind of two uh, you know a tale of two cities. Uh, you had. Uh, e-commerce historically was, you know, focused on growth, 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 kind of, uh, you know, aggressively, and um, you know had a, uh, you know, very, very much a growth mindset, and not really a profitable mindset in that business. On the brick and mortar, which is, you know, Matt provided the breakdown, uh, the majority of the business, uh, different story. You know, great, uh, you know, strong, profitable businesses. When you look at our e-commerce business, we we've already reached, you know. "Quote unquote scale when it comes to top line, pretty good, uh, pretty good business there. And when it comes to how we can, you know, more um, uh, conservatively address that market, there are very, very specific things that we put in place. For example, there's some things we're doing on the tech side that really streamline operations. Things we're doing on the the fulfillment side that do the same thing. And so from from you know the early days where the company was, you know, trying to grow rapidly and not focusing on profitability, it's actually a business now that um, I'd argue, absolutely in of itself, by itself, can, should, will um, be profitable. And then we uh, layer on the brick and mortar businesses as well, and, and the store warehouse format businesses as well, uh, collectively, all that kind of comes together. So the biggest shift, you know, for me coming into the company, uh, I believe was the mindset that the online e-commerce business in of itself absolutely can um, be self, uh, self-sustaining. And it's a different um uh, shift from, you know, how that business was viewed potentially in the past. And so I'm a big believer in all pieces of a, of a, a collective company kind of holding their own weight, um, you know, driving, driving results, and then also growing, but growing in ways that, um, you know, can be, be done through, through cash flow. So it's not that we're against aggressive growth. It's just, I don't, you know, personally believe you need to, um, you know, kind of burn the boats to to achieve that. If that makes sense. Yeah, and maybe just to add, to, just clarifying, um, we we are profitable at, at this point. So I think when we when we say uh, achieve profitability, I think we have uh, proven that in Q3 and Q4 of 2022, and 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 have that run rate going into 2023. So really, and again, a lot of that's coming from fixed cost reductions to the e-commerce part of the business, um, as mentioned before, uh, then adjusting our marketing spend down uh, and then adjusting uh, some of the pricing uh, on that e-commerce side as well. So really shoring up that that side of the business. Uh, I think, yeah, and then to, to Sean's point, I think looking forward, I think there's opportunities that we haven't tapped into yet to improve that profitability. And as we expand the revenue growth as well. So things like the synergies that we have started to, to work through uh, between between the brick and mortar and the e-commerce around product pricing, and then also the warehouse uh, warehousing and making sure that we can utilize the brick and mortar warehousing uh, spaces uh, effectively to, to reduce some of our warehousing costs on the e-commerce side. So I think uh, just wanted to be very clear that we've kind of done a lot of the heavy or we've done some of the heavy lifting to get uh, to cash flow positive and really moving forward, we're, we're, we're uh, looking to just improve that situation. Yeah, no, thanks for adding that. Actually, I think that's very important for the audience to note that you have shown in the last two quarters that you can be cash flow positive. Um, so uh, just a, a few other questions here, guys. So what's the current institutional ownership of Build Direct? 
Yeah, in terms of exact numbers, um, we had, so 65% are within those three um, institutions mentioned, Pelicanus, BD Capital, and, and Lyric Growth. Uh, we do have some other invest institutional investors um, that make up probably about another 10%. So it's, it's expected around 75% of, of the business is, is, is institutional at this point. Okay, great. And uh, one of the things I'm not sure if anyone noticed, what's the current enterprise value of the company? So those are based off of um, February 24th share price. Um, so it was... Um, uh, 15.3 million US and 20.2 million Canadian. Okay, great. And then just one uh, last question here from the audience. m and is a big um, a component of your growth trajectory. Um, how do you plan on financing that given the current share price and um, you know, debt situation? Yeah, I can, I can jump in here uh, quickly. I think Sean's got some opinions on this as well uh, with his experience in the space. But just to be clear, in terms of the M&A, we structure them so that they're 50% um, or lower cash up front. And then the remainder is coming from um, uh, earn out or, or deferred consideration payments uh, that can stretch upwards of fi five years out. So I think Moving forward, we're expecting to pay down debt payments or debt, outstanding debt to free up um, space on our balance sheet to either expand our debt facilities to help with those acquisitions uh, or transfer some of that, um, that debt to the, uh, to the actual uh, former owners through a vendor take back loan. So I think uh, we're not expecting to need um, significant resources for for those that m a activity so I think Sean has some other uh ideas on on on, on the m a activity moving forward so yeah so uh, definitely very well aligned with with Matt's <laughs> Matt's thoughts um in addition to that so when you think about growth just kind of just kind of at a like basic level um by combining the the uh e-commerce and also the the store format together it also allows for a pretty great path for organic growth because you have the ability to drive volume, for example, if we targeted the Pac Northwest, we could drive a considerable amount of volume, um, you know, in that area, and then from there, plug in you know, physical stores to fulfill those orders at a very low cost for, you know, for customer for pro delivery. But then also with that, be able to uh, sell through other channels more locally. So really combining those two things together uh, is a is you know by, by far one of the more interesting. Uh, growth strategies. Now, when it comes to find, when you have, you know, in a, let's say uh, a specific city like, you know, Dallas or, or Austin or, you know, somewhere, um, you know, somewhere up north and you have, you know, a great acquisition opportunity where it's a customer who might have three or four locations or five or six locations that are centered in the metro area and the business makes sense, the deal time on both sides makes sense, then that could be a great opportunity to index uh, in that market and and bring that company into the fold, but it's not a m a activity uh, at all costs because there's no organic growth options. the the former you know, model I mentioned is the the organic growth option, which is very kind of desirable and it provides um, it provides us really with the ability to be more selective on you know what targets really make uh, make sense. Um, the one soundbite I would leave, I'm not not a huge fan of of dilution for acquisition. Uh, it's just kind of a, uh, a sound bite that I just personally have a, you know, have uh, you kind of deeply embedded. Uh, does that mean we, we never will do it? No, um, does it, but the preponderance for me, uh, the, the primary strategy for me typically is, you know, buy a company that's, um, if you do buy a company or something, uh, if it's really worth it, there's other ways of taking care of it um, uh, versus kind of getting over your skis on, on the strategy that, uh, kind of erodes uh, shareholder value. Okay, fantastic. Uh, and just last question. Um, I guess what gets you guys excited? What are some catalysts and vectors can expect in the next six to 12 months? So I got to say, um, being in this industry for 20 years and seeing the massive progression for the business, uh, not just flooring, but really in all home services, the move towards the pro. Think about companies like Thumbtack, Angie's List, um, parent companies, IAC, Home Advisor, 
porch, um, you know, all these different, you know, ways that pros and, and end users are being connected and really knowing that with, with any category where you're fixing up or renovating a space, so much, you know, so much of it is the, the workmanship that really drives that, that transaction and the product gets pulled through, you know, so it's typically the person doing the work, uh, the company doing the work and then finding a product that will fit the need of a specific space. Um, and the, the, you know, the flooring industry, like, like many others has been backwards. It's all about product, 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 oh, attach the, the pro. And so when you see this, you know, all this energy coming into um, the, uh, the services space where companies are helping um, pros and customers find leads, uh, find each other. You're seeing um, tech being developed to help them operate their business. There's a new partnership we'll be talking about pretty soon there. That's going to be an example of that. And you effectively see the industry starting to move towards getting it right, where uh, that pro and that customer um, really are, are connecting. And sometimes, you know, it could be, uh, take different forms in different, uh, you know, different, uh, different fashions. And then for us being able to step in and ideally provide that bridge of products and services to, to further enable um, business owners to operate, um, whether it be small or large, uh, gives us a lot of, uh, a lot of excitement. And, you know, it feels like we're swimming with the, uh, with the current uh, huge tailwind kind of behind that, uh, you know, kind of behind that model. So uh, that plus the fact that we're, you know, very much not, um, uh, we're segment agnostic. So we're you know, definitely, uh, you know, broad brush and we'll, we serve pros wherever they are. So our pros today might be doing uh, installation or a sale for a track, uh, uh, you know, uh, track homes and tomorrow can flip over to commercial renovation. And then the next day flip over to restoration. Pros find the work wherever that work resides. And so for me, that gives me a lot of excitement and energy to help, um, you know, to kind of, them, you know, to, to service our customer without uh, us um, trying to guide or kind of force fit the, uh, the model. Uh, Matt, anything on your end that gets you excited? Yeah, I think, to be honest, I think it's, it's really Sean coming on board. Um, I think it's been, he's been in the chair coming up on six months here, but um, I think he's brought a lot of new ideas to the business and his flooring background has been a huge catalyst already in the past six months to unlock the synergies between the e-commerce and the brick and mortar. Something that we knew was there, but uh, actually executing on it needed someone with Sean's expertise around that. Uh, and then also just his experience on the e-commerce side to, to really look at that business, understand that it can be and it should be profitable and um, can generate growth. So. I think those that perspective um, has been uh, has been awesome in the past six months, and I expect to see more of that moving forward. Really, just having the the right operator with the right experience able to drive a good strategy. Okay, thank you, um, and that's it for questions. Um, thank you, uh, Sean and Matt, Sean Wilson, CEO of Build Direct, Matt Alexander, CFO of Build Direct, for the time today, uh, and to our audience for listening. If you do have any follow-up questions, uh, you can email us at ir at buildirect.com. Again, that's ir at buildirect.com. Thank you for listening today. Um, we will be sending over a copy of the presentation. Thanks, guys. Thank Thanks you. All.